viruses were described in biology textbooks, not police reports. Today, terms like these bring to mind crashed networks, massive disruptions in communications and infrastructure systems, and billions of dollars in damages. It's projected that cyber criminals will steal an estimated 33 billion records in 2023. How worried do we need to be about identity theft? Are our medical records secure? And what about keeping people from hacking into our phones? This is The Uncommon Engineer. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. Our guest today on The Uncommon Engineer podcast is Professor Angelos Karamidis, professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering and co-director of the Center for Cyber Operations Inquiry and Unconventional Sensing. Welcome to the program, Angelos. Thank you. You know, from my side, you know, I get these emails uh, that are phishing attacks where someone is trying to get me to log in and use my password into a fake, into a fake website. Um, and from there, they've got my login and password and can do all this kind of stuff. I think that's the kind of experience that many people know about and have, but it's so much broader than that. So can you start by talking a little bit about the kinds of attacks that are taking place, how vulnerable we are, and because, you know, there's a lot of kind of tech geeks here, you know, how cyber criminals eventually make their way into systems. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it, uh, it is a complicated one in, in many ways, as you might expect. Uh, so as you pointed out, a lot of uh, things, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh, that is promoted in the news that, uh, and, and also by the security industry uh, as to what's going on and how vulnerable people are, and so on. Uh, the truth of the matter is uh, we, have a, we have two general tracks, as it were, of bad behavior on the internet. One is profit motivated. So that's your run-of-the-mill criminal, or maybe not so run-of-the-mill that is trying to make money any way they can. And the second, and it's becoming increasingly uh, prominent, is uh, nation states playing on the internet. So I would say for an average person, primarily you have to worry about the, uh, the criminals, but increasingly our lives are going to be affected by how nation states act or position to act. Uh, in the future, um, you know, in the first category, I, you, you know, uh, again, because I think we have a pretty technical audience. Um, you know, there's data that's sitting out there in servers. It's sitting out in you know large databases. Uh, presumably, companies um, have done a really good job. Universities, by and large, do a really good job of protecting their data through passwords or through other security measures. Yet. Um, it still seems possible for, you know, very sophisticated uh, criminals to to access that data. And maybe and maybe that's a little different than where I started by, you know, people tricking you into giving them money. You know, there's kind of that piece. I'm a little more interested in, you know, how a cyber criminal breaks into the, the, some of these places that are holding 250, rec 250 million records and have, I'm sure, quite tight security. So can you talk about whether that's a false assumption about the, about the, uh, the tight security? And then how do people do that? Of course, without revealing uh, specific means, but you know, how, how does all that happen? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, so one of the interesting things about security is that, uh, that there is nothing ever fixed in, in stone. There is no, one way in which people break into systems, right? Anything that goes, goes. Uh, having said that, it is the case that the two, well, sorry, the three main ways in which 
people break into systems and steal data or information or engage in other nefarious activities are they con are social engineering, and there are two subcategories to that, or software vulnerability. So software vulnerabilities is simply software has some kind of bug that someone found and could exploit it <clears throat> to gain control of the software or the system. Uh, in the social engineering side, you have the two versions that you kind of alluded to in the beginning. One is you get these attempts to uh, to trick you into logging into a site or otherwise providing your your password um, for for some kind of service. Uh, and the second is you're asked to click on an attachment uh, and uh, presumably see some important information. So. I would say, I mean, statistics are, are generally hard to find, but but or, or conclusive statistics. But I would say that probably 90%, if not higher, of all the the attacks, and certainly more than that, of the attacks that we see in the news, uh, happen that way. The two versions of social engineering: either give me your credentials, or here I sent you something that may look like a document from a trusted source. You click on it. And it does something bad, so it has some code hidden in it that somehow gets to execute. Uh, that probably accounts for the majority of problems. Uh, but some of the problems that you typically see on servers, uh, so the, these big issues that we see periodically of uh, somebody broke into uh, a, a uh, corporate network or a cloud environment where a big company had its data and stole 500 million records or whatever, uh, those typically, but not always, happen because there was a bug on uh, vulnerability, a flaw in software, and either nobody knew of it or the company that was operating that software did not get around to, to fix it. And so somebody exploited it and managed to get access to the servers. So then the second piece, by virtue of the fact, say I'm, at a, I'm on a website, um, let's say a bank, um, Clearly, I'm entering data, my information, whether it's personal information or anything. As I, you know, there, there's a there's a, a back and forth between myself and, and not just the website, but myself and the bank. And so, by virtue of that, I'm already interacting with their with their system by virtue of just using just using the website. And you're saying that uh, if there are there potential vulnerabilities in the software that's running that website or the application that's running inside that then you might be able to figure out a way to to exploit so so that's interesting that you know there's no credential needed you're already interacting with their with their network with their applications you but you might be smart enough to get your way deeper into the application than other than you would you would guess otherwise so i i think i have that one right yeah, you're, you're right. And as a concrete example, the Equifax compromise from uh, a couple of years ago uh, followed that pattern. So there was a vulnerability on a public-facing uh, component, and they could get access. Sure. So before we leave kind of the social engineering side, it would be only prudent for us uh, with our audience to talk about best practices for keeping uh, being safe in those in those environments and so what are the are there a handful of rules of thumb either on 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 the the three different social or the two different social engineering aspects that you talk about what are the what are the rules of thumb that that you would recommend that people people follow yeah so so the one interesting thing uh before i answer directly your question i'll say the one interesting thing about social engineering attacks are that uh, they are easy to use in what's called the spray and pray mode uh, meaning an attacker can can do a broad campaign that would look perhaps like a spam email spam seeking to uh, convince as many people, but not necessarily any specific person, to give them the credentials or to open an attachment and so on. Uh, so, so there's a baseline, a lower level, as it were, of these generic campaigns that don't target you as a person. Um, but of course, if you if you somehow uh, get uh, compromised that way, then they will act upon the credentials or the accesses they've acquired. Now, there's a second level above that, 
which is uh, campaigns that are a little more targeted. And they may be targeted to a particular company, for example, or to a particular university or to a particular organization. An example of that would be, uh, because I've received a few of those over the past couple of years, uh, emails purporting to be either from the provost or from the chair or from the dean um, addressed to sort of all the faculty, right? And, and so those are a little more tailored, but still kind of broad. And then there's a third level above that, which is um, uh, the, the lower levels, you call them spear phishing. This one, uh, it's sometimes referred to as whale hunting or whale fishing. Uh, meaning you go out after a specific target uh, that is of high value, right? So the company CEO or the person in charge of the uh, financial accounts. So you see different levels of sophistication across the three different campaigns. So the lowest level one that is sent indiscriminately almost uh, typically is fairly easy to to tell that it's that something is funny simply by looking either to what it's pointing at like it wants you to click on something taking you to a website for example uh well is the website the legitimate website uh or it's asking you to open an attachment for which there's not a whole lot of justification given right we're the irs and we're sending you a spreadsheet that describes your your tax due well, a lot of people will actually get worried about this, and that's what this plays on. Um, honestly, for for that kind of attack, um, it's mostly common sense, but I realize that oftentimes we work under stress, we're tired, whatever you receive at the wrong time, the email. So I would say uh, the the two easiest things to do, uh, one, for any sensitive service that you use, please turn on two-factor authentication. Uh, so that is a password is not sufficient to get you logged on, but you need something else. And the something else sometimes is a phone or a specific application on the phone or, or for the higher security or higher importance websites, uh, perhaps a dedicated hardware token, uh, a little device, specific to your bank, for example. So, so that goes a long way to mitigate some of these attacks. Uh, clicking on attachments is really hard to, uh, uh, to get people not to do because that's how we work. We send files to each other all the time. Uh, but consider the source. And most of the emails that you'll, you'll receive Honestly, they shouldn't be sending you any attachments from strangers that you need to open. Uh, if you go to the second level, that becomes harder because now the attacks are tailored and the source from which these attacks come are plausible at least. So if the dean sends me a PDF and asks me for a, for a realistic question, I'd be more inclined to open that. Um, so again, uh, some some degree of, of common sense, and then um, things like, well, don't double-click the attachment, save it first. Uh, look at it on the disk, and then if you decide it makes sense, open it, because oftentimes once you save it on a disk, it, it looks what it really is as opposed to what it's on the, what appears to be on the email. Um, and there are uh, there are applications, there are services you can use to vet attachments, uh, but it requires mostly a conscious decision by by the user. Um, in certain cases, I use a, a or speaking for myself, uh, I use a burn a burn laptop, one that I don't really care about. I'll move an attachment there and open it if. I really need to open it, but I'm not 100% sure. Now, the third level of attacks is really hard to, to deal with because now we're talking about an attack that took the time to know you and took the time to know the environment in which you operate and how you operate. 
uh, as an example, and it's not a perfect example. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, it was uh, a New York Times article came out that talked about how the North Koreans, uh, or allegedly the North Koreans, compromised the bank in ba Bangladesh, the central bank, and stole $80 million from the central bank account. Um, that group stayed in that network watching two machines that were used for doing these transactions for over a month. And they were looking at how the users were using legitimately the application before they went through with their action. And then, and then uh, impersonated, had the credentials of one of those users so that the system recognized them as a legitimate user and a legitimate action. Absolutely. And the only reason they got caught is they made a mistake in one of the transactions. Otherwise, they would have gotten away with it and with more money. Are there other, you know, kind of emerging areas that people are particularly worried about that we don't think about? I mean, maybe not my refrigerator, even though my refrigerator is going to be on the Internet. Um, you know, what are the what are the other areas that people are talking about that that the public should know about? But, well, um, it, it also depends on the immediacy of results and the, the general goal of, of, of the perpetrator, as it were. Um, right. So, for example, uh, I think uh, I recall a couple of articles a few, a few years ago about allegedly Iranian actors targeting or trying to target uh, water dams. In, uh, and I think there was one article uh, I remember that, uh, that there had been a serious attempt, and I don't recall how successful it was, about a, a water reservoir in, in New York State. So, um, you know, water, water causing damage there is not perhaps as immediately dramatic, right? The lights aren't going to go off. The water isn't necessarily going to turn off on the taps right away. Uh, but people worry about that sort of thing. Uh, and so if it comes out that suddenly the water supply for, I don't know, Atlanta or New York City or something has been affected, uh, the, the monetary damage may not be there, the, the human damage may not be there, but the sort of concern might be there. And, and in certain cases, the reason to undertake such actions may not be for the damage, but for the sort of eroding the, to send a message and erode the will to, to do something. Uh, so in the middle of political negotiations, in the middle of a crisis, the drawdown on the East China Sea, wherever the crisis might be, that can be used as a sort of reminder that there are assets at risk. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really, any anything that you can imagine uh, that either can be affected or can be seen to be affected matters, right? So, uh, gas, uh, oil, um, the healthcare system. If uh, somehow all the electronic records went down for uh, for a week or two, uh, and it doesn't have to be for everybody, but for some of the major healthcare suppliers, if they all disappear. Uh, that suddenly ha starts to have an impact on people's lives, and and you know that can be leveraged for political uh, purposes. I mean, by other nations. Well, I know that you you've come to Georgia Tech just uh, in the last couple of years from uh, from a senior level position at DARPA, the Adv the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency within the U.S. government, and were a professor before then, and so. You kind of seen academia, then uh, research community in in the U.S. Defense Department, and now back to academia. So I'm really curious about how those. You know, we talked an awful lot about the various threats, about the various scenarios. I'm really curious about how, both a little bit about your path and and you know why that path and really how it informs the work that you're doing in your lab today. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, I mean, even <clears throat> for myself, looking back at it, it's a sort of unexpected path in, in certain ways. Uh, it started not very unusual uh, for every, as most or many grad students finish and they decide uh, the academic life uh, appeals to them. 
I was doing research in security and I continued to do research in security. Uh, and, you know, for the most part, that meant trying to build better defenses. Uh, and the information that I had about what the bad guys were doing is were, were what's in the news or anything that I could find out uh, through my research. Um, at some point, I decided that wasn't enough. Uh, and that point came really uh, at the same time uh, as DARPA coming to me and saying, hey, would you would you be, consider doing a, a tour, uh, a temporary tour of duty with DARPA, uh, which which is not uncommon uh, for DARPA to ask people that have been involved in DARPA projects uh, to then sort of come and push a vision uh, of their own in terms of the research that they want to be done. Um, and so it was mostly for my personal education, if it were, as it were, I wanted to know, okay, is there anything really that I don't know? Uh, and of course there is, but what is it that I don't know? Uh, and, and so DARPA offered me a fantastic uh, opportunity to see what's happening uh, at the nation state level, uh, both on our side and what we see about uh, adversaries doing. And that was... Um, in some ways, not surprising, in some ways, shocking. Uh, it was interesting to see the amount of activity, the intensity of activity, uh, and the uh, dedication of all sides to what they were doing. Um, and, and the fact that, so we think of armies and we think of DOD as, you know, other than the active engagements that we have in, say, I don't know, Syria or to have in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, most of the everybody else is standing down, they're training, they're maintaining, and so on. So it's kind of a, a, a be ready posture. Uh, not so for the cyber side of things. Uh, everybody is actually working, maybe not to the extent that they would be working if there was an actual war going on, but not that far off either. Um, and so it was interesting to see that and to see the problems that arise from operating in an environment like this, uh, which, as you can imagine, if you take the problems that we see, or at least uh, sort of hypothesis about the problems that exist in the private sector, and we see the effects of them, the compromises and the social engineering attacks and all that, and data being stolen and money being stolen and so on, um, you can multiply those, uh, both as actual things happening, but also as potential of bad things happening. Uh, and so my, my sort of outlook on, on things, on, on the field, I would say changed because of uh, scientific insights. It changed by looking at what is going on uh, the scale of things, and kind of a recognition that the path that we had been taking uh, may have been satisfactory from a researcher point of view. Like, I'm very proud of the work that I did, but ultimately, the the impact that these things had uh, was either too long or just not there. So a lot of the work that, that we did was great academic work. I didn't make much of a difference at the end of the day. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so while I was at DARPA, I tried to change uh, part of the, the direction of the field, as it were, right? That's the one great thing you hold the purse strings. You can change or you can, you can steer at least what people find inter uh, interesting problems. And the one thing there that I'm very proud of is that I was able to do this with unclassified problems. Because uh, when you start talking about nation states and the problems of nation states, very quickly you end up in a classified world. Uh, so I'm, I'm proud and happy that, that I managed not only to fund I don't know, well, almost half a billion worth of research, uh, but also to do a lot of it as much in the open 
as possible. So funding universities, small businesses, big businesses, but in the classified uh, domain, which meant that there are also scientific improvements for being done there. Um, so having done all that and my tour coming to an end, I looked at what I wanted to do. And I decided academia, at least in the immediate future or in the, well, whatever, the next 10 years at that time, uh, was probably where I wanted to, to be again, uh, both for personal reasons, but also for the freedom uh, that it gave me to pursue the things that I wanted to pursue. Um, but then the, the work that I want to pursue is tied to the insights I've had, obviously, from, from what I was uh, what I, I found out uh, in my years with the government. One of the things that you had mentioned before is there's not enough of you, um, you know, out there doing this kind of work. So that I think that means, you know, cybersecurity trained engineers or network security engineers, all of those things. Can, can you talk about the need broadly? We, we keep hearing about that. Um, you know, what's the need broadly for that? And uh, you know, what, what we should be doing to prepare uh, prepare students, at least even partially, even if they don't take that as a career, even partially to be prepared for some of the threats that you talked about? Yeah, so broadly, I see two different kind of needs here. One is train the engineers that are gonna be doing regular engineering things. And I, I mean, like they're gonna be building systems, writing software, the things that engineers have always been doing and are going to be doing, but knowing what what exists, because you know honestly they're the ones that need to be taking advantage of the features, using the tools that are going to allow systems to be designed and built uh, inherently more secure. Uh, then there is the need for the specialists, uh, and the specialists are the ones that are going to build more of these capabilities or are going to architect a bigger system that brings together capabilities, security capabilities, I mean, from different components and from different subsidiary systems and result in a more secure architecture now. Uh, the former means we need sort of to, to pervade security into our curriculum. And, and of course, that's hard uh, because I know certain things, but so I'm not an expert in microtransistors. So what can I tell to somebody doing a, a hardware design course about security at that level, uh, other than the general sort of, hey, here are security primitives. Um, and then for the specialists, the challenge is that because security is a transverse sort of discipline, it cuts across a whole lot of different uh, of verticals in, in knowledge, uh, it means that for somebody to get, to really get into it, they have to have a good knowledge of at least some uh, system component, whether it's you start from networking, you start from software, you start from architecture, whatever it is, and then you build with security on, kind of on top of it as you learn, or at the very least in parallel with it. Um, and so, Neither of those things, uh, well, the first is kind of easier conceptually to, to do at scale, but it's still challenging because you need to find the right messaging per course student. Uh, the latter is very hard because it means requires a really sustained investment of time by the people. And that means right now the best way we can do it is really get somebody through a master's program. Uh, and, and or even beyond. So a, an undergrad degree, kind of hard to cram everything in. Well, I know that I think it's one of the service academies, maybe it's against the Naval Academy or, or West Point now have a required, and it makes sense, that now have a required cybersecurity course, maybe for every student or at least every engineer. And I think, you know, those, hmm. are, those are the kind of things that, you know, we occasionally kick around because I think, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest, you know, I, I see cyber threats in the same vein as other existential threats. And I really am not using that word lightly, um, you know, around climate change and other kinds of things where they're really true 
threats to manage, just like, as you pointed out, like a nu nuclear threats, we kind of, we seem to have worked our way through, you know, uh, some much of the nuclear threat, obviously that's still out there. It's not the prominence that it had at once, but it's certainly out there, but I certainly see cyber threats in that same, same, you know, category if we it, like the mutually assured destruction kinds of scenario. So I think it is super important and we really do need, I think we need to find a way for at least every engineer or even broader than that to have some exposure um, to that. So I'll, I'll just add to what you said. Um, nuclear weapons have a, a high threshold for use. Uh, basically, they've never been used in anger since, um, what was it now, uh, 65, no, 75 years ago. Um, because everybody knows the consequences. Uh, that's not the case with cyber. Right? The consequences may not, right now at least, be quite as severe or, or not, nowhere near as severe, except for perhaps contrived uh, scenarios people might think for movie purposes. Uh, but, but those consequences, those are going, are increasing or the potential impact. But the threshold to do these things we see is very low. And so my, my, my fear, my worry is either we sleepwalk into a situation where that is generally accepted. So we have an increasing level of somewhat destructive attacks happening and but nobody but they don't cross the threshold of actually doing anything about it because everybody does it um, or that we get to the point to a point where they are such attacks are still viewed as acceptable especially compared with armed conflict like kinetic conflict or god forbid nukes uh, but the but we haven't recognized that now, right? Something that we did that we could do in 2015 or 2010, and it would have had a very localized minimal impact. We do it in 2030, and it affects the whole country and it shuts it down, right? And that might call, catch people by surprise. Nobody knows what the impact of some of these things is going to be. You're uh, here at Georgia Tech after a stint at at DARPA, and it sounds like you've been, you know, very well informed. Uh, about the kinds of problems that you'd like to work on uh, in an even more independent and open environment of the university. I really would love to hear a little bit about some of your projects, what your group looks like, you know, the kinds of things you're interested in, the kinds of things you'd like to explore. Yeah, uh, so uh, upon arriving here, we formed a, uh, a colleague uh, and uh, a good friend at this point, Manos Antonakakis, uh, and I decided that our research interests aligned very well. Uh, and I knew Manos through some of his work in uh, DARPA projects, DARPA programs. Uh, we decided to form a, a new center uh, to pursue at least, well, much of the work that I want to do sort of in a joint fashion. Uh, so that's the Center for uh, Cyber Operations Inquiry and uh, Unconventional Sensing, um, which is, in fact, the uh, sort of it's a it's a little bit of a double play. Uh, the acronym is COIUS, which is the Greek Titan for intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, and and so it's the right it's the C2 Center, it's the COIUS Center, right? So the intelligence. Uh, and plays a little bit on this notion that uh, we're looking at things in the kind of sort of nation state significance, uh, and so hence intelligence. Uh, so a lot of what we're we're looking at is the intersection of uh, big data, um, cyber operations, and security. Uh, and so the reason for that is uh, at least in part because when you're looking to have uh, impact and to get this visibility on what is happening in the world, even if you then need to uh, narrow down in a particular problem domain, you need to know what is everybody doing, uh, what is happening in the world, uh, and how can you translate macro knowledge to specific knowledge for specific problems, right? So. So there's a thread of work that has to do with 
big data, big network data analysis, uh, right? And that has systems uh, problems. How do you deal with petabytes of data? Uh, has algorithmic background. What do you do once you have that data and you can process it correctly? But then it ties into the security side very strongly. So that's the motivation of, well, what kinds of data are you going to look into and why are you looking at it? So it, that is driven by knowledge of how our ad adversaries work, how we work, how criminals work, and how the world works, right? There's a lot of data out there. It doesn't mean all of it is useful and interesting. And then taking that knowledge and the insights that come from having the data, the analytics, and the sort of domain knowledge, and finding uh, interesting verticals, as it were, uh, where you can apply the knowledge in specific environments. So a project that we are just about to start, was awarded a couple of months ago, is one for security for 5G uh, environments, infrastructures. And so uh, there, as an example, we're looking at what kind of capabilities uh, could be deployed in 5G networks, infrastructures, but also on end devices, potentially a phone, a 5G phone, uh, that would enable, to begin with in the context of, say, a DOD network, uh, the, would enable defenders to protect, to defend the network more efficiently than they do now. And that then breaks down into, well, what are the pain points that they encounter, and that comes from domain expertise and continued interactions. But then there's a, well, what kind of technologies could we develop? What could we put in the routers? What could we, could we put in data centers? What could we put in the phones that will allow us to better, faster, or easily find the bad guys, remove them, and so on? And so my brain is just saying like, oh my gosh, they just decided on 5G. Isn't it all secure? You know, this is their, we're just about to launch all that. And, you're, and, you're, and by the existence of your project, you're saying, you know, cause I'm kind of, you, you talked both about, you know, the end users, i.e. the phones and all that, and then the network. And so, um, so I think, I, I guess the answer is, well, there's a, there's a lot of work that needed to be done uh, that maybe could have been done. Well, um, I hope you got the sense that I could keep talking about this stuff. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, there are so many aspects and, and pieces to it, and uh, you, you've had a really fantastic and interesting career, and we're really lucky to have you here on, on campus. Um, I know we get to see each other off and on, and uh, really can't thank you enough for everything you're doing for our students, um, for the research community in, in Georgia Tech, and can't wait to see the amazing things that uh, are gonna come out of your research efforts. So thanks, Angelos, very much for coming here today on The Uncommon Engineer. Steve, thank you for having me both on the, the podcast and at Georgia Tech, since you were the one that hired me. <laughs> okay, well, take care, and we'll see you around campus.